What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Vintage and Stuff Podcast. Uh, you're rocking with me, Drew Heifetz. And today I have Nick, aka Spare Bricks underscore on Instagram. And this is the Patagonia Nerd episode. We are going to dive super deep into all things Patagonia history, um, product talk rare details, differences between certain garments, values of garments, what makes something collectible. Uh, talk about like tons of their most popular lines. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in Patagonia, you're definitely going to want to listen to this episode. If you're interested in reselling, you definitely want to going to want to listen to this episode. There's a lot to learn for the collectors, a lot to learn for anybody who has ever found a Patagonia garment, a lot to learn. Um, yeah, about vintage, about the history of the company. So yeah, this is the Patagonia nerd episode. And the reason I got my man Nick on the show is because he knows more than anybody. I found him because he was posting a lot of stuff that was way deeper than the knowledge I had on certain garments. And again, like I love the shit. But I don't know everything. And uh, it's good to have somebody like Nick come on and tell us more than we already know. So thank you guys for tuning in. Stoked to be back here. Took a little break from the show, but we are back rolling out weekly episodes once again, bringing you lots of knowledge that are going to help you in your business on the day-to-day. So uh, buckle your seatbelts, and uh, here we go on the Patagonia episode. Right, Nick. Welcome to the show, my man. Thank you for having me. So, Nick is coming to us from his dorm room at UMass, and we are going to be talking about everything Patagonia today. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, why don't you kick this off? You know, I'm excited to get into this. You know that I am a Patagonia fan, collector, and you kind of hit me up a while ago, or actually, yeah, I think you hit me up and then I, I got to sort of see what you're posting and you're also a collector and you're very invested into the history, into the knowledge, uh, the details of the clothing. So just give us a, the rundown of how you got interested in Patagonia and what interests you about it, how you started collecting. Oh man. Uh, I'd say I first ran into Patagonia as a high schooler, and I would only see, like, the basic P6 logo tees. And I actually thought it was, like, a preppy brand, like uh, Vineyard Vines or something, because it was always the jocks that would wear it. So that's sort <laughs> yeah. of, like, a negative – yeah, like, a negative connotation at first. But then later, um, when I was, like, 18, 19, I got into streetwear, and naturally fleeces got into that. So I picked up a retro X on sale at a skate shop. And it was like my beater fleece for the longest time. And uh, long story short, I ended up working at a um, pre-owned designer and vintage store in Boston. And through that, um, I got to interact with a lot of pieces and um, sort of piqued my interest. And uh, I would see some pieces on Instagram here and there as well. Um, and in fact, your collection videos back in like 2021, 20, 22, those were pretty like uh, foundational for me, I would say. Seeing other people get enthusiastic about it. And, um, yeah, it was sort of just like a slippery slope from there. I just got deeper and deeper into it. That's awesome. So the first thing you said there is that you picked up a retro X at a skate shop. Did this, did the skate shop oh, yeah. have a, ra- a rack of vintage or something out? Like, no, no, no. Um, theory out here in Western <clears throat> mass, they actually, they're a ski and sno- they're a snowboard and skate shop. So they actually have a Patagonia account. Oh, no so, like, way. Picked up a re- yeah. Picked up a retro X on sale for like a hundred bucks. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's rad. And uh, tell us more about this this designer consignment shop you worked at. 
Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like freshman year of high school or um, college, we uh, I got together with some friends and we started an online fashion magazine. People were we were on the street wearing designer fashion, and uh, over the pandemic, that actually evolved into yeah, opening up. It was originally a pop up shop on uh, Newbury in Boston, but it evolved into um, yeah, getting flowing through vintage dealers, having them consign stuff, and that's when I actually got into like vintage as well as uh, Patagonia at first. Um, a lot of the vintage dealers I know right now go all the way back to that. So we would uh, get some pieces in. I would have, I would be in the stock room actually, um, pricing stuff up and uh, trying it on, interacting with it. That was very foundational cool. for me. How yeah. did that store do? Uh, we did pretty well. Um, but uh, internal conflicts led to it being uh, done by like, we started in like November 2020 and it was done by like April 21. Too many partners yeah. couldn't figure out, couldn't come together as uh, yeah, yeah, stuff like that as collaboratives. Uh, yeah, well, classic story that shit happens. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, sweet man. So, what are you studying there at UMass? Oh, I study art history. Oh, nice. So you're you're into history all around. Oh, big time. Yeah. Nice. All right, so I'm excited. This is going to be the Patagonia nerd episode. We're gonna we're gonna dive into history. We're gonna dive into all these interesting details about the clothing. We're gonna talk about uh, the company, Yvonne Schwinard, um, and just see where this conversation goes. I think we both have a lot of interest in it and know a lot about it. So uh, oh, yeah. I might even be like re- referencing some uh, some real data and some some articles to talk about certain aspects of what's going on over there. Mm. so so yeah nick kick it off like let's let's just start at the very beginning here um the history and founding of the company with yvonne schwinard yeah so schwinard is a legendary climber um he got to start um in terms of product he was a blacksmith and that's how he like paid to go on all these climbing trips back in like the 50s and 60s um and that sort of evolved into um Schwinard Equipment, which was like his hard goods business, doing pitons and all the fittings for climbing because uh, what was available at the time was either uh, poor quality or was like detrimental to the environment. So he and his friends like got together, um, made up a bunch of um, literature on clean climbing, as they called it. And he became like a well-known figure in like the Yosemite scene back in the late 60s. But um, around yeah, the, that's that, that's yeah. interesting. Interesting to talk about that era for a minute. Like when we mm-hmm. talk clean, I, like I'm not a climber. I don't really. I just know the history from what I know. But I guess the clean climbing discussion is that people would put the um, pitons in the rock and leave them. They never could get mm-hmm. taken out, right? And then yeah, clean yeah. climbing movement was to like create uh, these things that. You could put in the rock and take out of the rock, so you didn't mm-hmm. have to leave like like leave no trace camping exactly. similarities. And um, <clears throat> prior to like the climbing movement of this era, climbing was was like this like European mountaineer Swiss endeavor. Uh, I'm trying to yep. paint a picture here where like people would like put up ladders up the cliff and then like climb up ladders. And it was way more of like a gentleman's kind of sport. It wasn't. Oh really yeah. T- it was like British I mean? dudes who wanted to show off and like, uh, be, yeah, it was like the next level of like Ernest Shackleton dudes going to the Arctic. The next thing they wanted to do is go all the way up on the highest mountains. Yeah, exactly. So it was like, they would just get to the ty- highest mountain by any means necessary, not caring about the process. And then this generation yeah. started to care about, how we did it it's more about mm-hmm. the sport of it <clears throat> um yeah anyway continue on so it was at this time like Schwinard equipment actually one more thing i will actually we'll talk about that later Schwinard equipment at this point was do you, do you know if, if, if it started in um in california in uh what's the town where it's at right uh, now uh ventura ventura yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. He had like his workshop there and Patagonia headquarters is like attached to that right now. Like they're still in that area. His original workshop is still there. Yeah, I've been to that. Uh, I surf near there because literally yeah. if you go to the Patagonia headquarters now, it's like two blocks from C Street, which is one of the yeah. most famous like Ventura. Well, probably the most famous Ventura surf break. 
Yeah. Um, and I think some of the same, it's literally like they just renovated the same buildings that they were in in those old days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so great, great Pacific Ironworks. That, um, that's like the umbrella company that Schoenart Equipment was under. And then um, around 1972, um, Schoenart was on a hiking trip in or a climbing trip in Scotland. And it was there that he encountered these Umbro rugby shirts at like a sportswear store. And he uh, started looking at them and thought they were like perfect for climbing. And they also looked really good. So he picked up a few, brought them back to California. And like everybody on the everybody on the walls were like, what, what are you wearing? Because they're so colorful and uh, evocative and also really, really functional with like the very thick collars. They're perfect for uh, putting slings around and all that. And so he eventually got the idea to start importing them and selling them to his fellow climbing friends. And that sort of grew into a business of him importing clothing um, from like private label, slapping his own labels on them in many cases. Um, so that was like the software arm of Great Pacific Ironworks as it was originally known. And then it became uh, Patagonia Software, essentially. Yeah. Um, it's it's a wicked cool history if you ask me mm. because it's it's very like born out of functionality born out of a need for something right exactly. when you look back at like all the all the like like kind of like history in the mountains history in sports it doesn't evolve without the equipment to let it evolve you know what i mean and mm -hmm. and this is like one of those innovations right so he's like he gets these shirts like you said from europe these umbro shirts the collar I think was really good because he could flip the collar and have the rope like around. Yeah. So it wouldn't you rub your like neck. A, put a sling over your shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. And then also like those rugby shirts, everyone can probably agree. Like the, the thickness of the cotton is like a bit heavier. It's like a nice thick oh, cotton. Yeah. So I think, I think at the time nobody was making a sport specific climbing anything. Right. They were just not probably, really. Uh, no. Yeah. So yeah, they're like, they're um, rubbing up against rock. They're like, these things are durable. They, those rugby's also have like reinforced uh, elbows because these guys yeah. are like rolling around in the freaking dirt with each other. Mm -hmm. And these things are freaking awesome. And he's like, damn, these are sick. So we're, we're yeah. going to put some pictures. I have, I have the evolution of these rugby's, which you've probably yeah, seen yeah. from my videos. It's like yeah. the original seventies rugby. Then there's the rugby that is the umbro rugby that he, he, put the Schwinard label in. Then yeah. there's like the Great Pacific. I think there's one that has like a Great Pacific Ironworks specific mm -hmm. tag. And then eventually it's like he's producing a very similar lookalike yeah. rugby in, with, under the Patagonia early tag. There's a white tag yeah, and yeah. even a black tag. Yeah. Like I think he started outsourcing them private label at a certain point and making them under his own name. But um, the first thing that they actually made themselves, the first clothing design by Patagonia was the um, stand-up shorts in like the mid 70s. And that came out of like, uh, he really wanted, yeah, a really durable short slash pant. So he got like the thickest like duck canvas you can possibly get. And they started making these uh, shorts out of them. And the stand-up name comes with the fact that you could literally put them on a table and they would stand up. Um, and that's that was their first uh, original clothing design. Yeah, <laughs> probably super uncomfortable. The original prototypes of those, you're like, yeah, yeah you have to like take... really break those in. <laughs> yeah, you're like six months on uh, the north wall before these things are like yeah. broken in. You know what I mean? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, that's uh, you know, again, like the heavy canvas. He's trying to make something that would last, like rubbing up against um, rock time and time again. Mm -hmm. um, they have these like huge back pockets with these like funky curvature yeah it's like a b-ring pocket yeah yeah they're very interesting and again like this is <clears throat> something that they still make to this day and they probably still make the rugby's to this day but the stand-up short has been like one of their key designs mm -hmm. throughout the whole history of the company yeah rugby's and, in the stand-up shorts staples yeah and you know looking at that looking at how much longevity they've had out of those products you're like wow that's crazy most companies don't last more than a season with mm. a certain product right because they're so focused on style and fashion but when you when you design and build out of function things become timeless and you're like if this works for the function yeah. we're, and people still need 
something for that function. It, it, it te te technically can last forever. And then it even transcends itself into fashion because of that, because now it's like, you know, uh, it has a purpose and, and the details for that purpose create, you know, I think some sort of beauty, right? Oh, big time. Uh, that whole, yeah, form follows function type thing. Yeah. I think yeah. that's, uh, I've always been like that. I always think that about clothing in general, like military clothing. So much of it is transcended into fashion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's, there's innovate, all the best innovation in clothing has come from some sort of functional need, whether it's military, whether it's climbing, like we're talking about here, um, whether it's, uh, mining cowboy mm -hmm. culture like it could have been anything but it's like they designed for a purpose and then it, it transcends history and becomes like the most iconic things in fashion <clears throat> yeah that's really how i got into vintage honestly um because i was into designer and streetwear and most of the desi those designs are appropriated from military vintage pieces and i was like i might as well just get the original or something that's uh you know more closely connected to that for a way uh a way uh, cheaper price and something that was more um, akin to what I was feeling after. Yeah, I think that's cool to, to kind of touch on too, because um, I think that sort of like uh, same thing that happened to you with streetwear into like the roots of where the designs came from happened to a lot of people through this like sneaker culture, then, then mm. um, streetwear and then they're like, wow, there's like all this history behind it. And when you, when you start to unravel the layers or peel back the layers, it becomes more interesting, right? Oh yeah. You get sucked in the whole history of what that reference piece is, where that comes from, um, whatever brand that came from. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. So I, I think that has a big piece in booming the, in the business, um, in, in general, like after a while, when you've been in vintage, you can go to the mall. And you could be like, that's from a military peacoat. That's an M41. Mm. That's like a copy of a 501. That's this, that's this, that's this. Because yeah, nothing, yeah. there's there's very little completely new, like no one's, no one's like inventing a new type of garment. They're just referencing different things and putting pieces together. Yeah, for the most part, unless you get into like really high end, like couture <laughs> runway stuff. Yeah. And then nobody wears that shit anyway. That's just for, exactly. just for show. <laughs> not, even, not even functional. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's continue on. So yeah. we're at the point with the stand up short. Uh, so I guess at that point, was the Patagonia name already brought into it or were the first stand up shorts in like a Schwinard equipment label? Yeah. The first ones were under Schwinard equipment, Great Pacific Ironworks. They would have like double tags usually. Um, but it wasn't until like, yeah, around 1974, Patagonia became a thing. Um, it was originally Patagonia software. Um, that's where you see the original, like P, uh, original skyline tag, the white label. Um, yeah, there's actually a first and a second edition of that. Um, but I don't know exactly if it denotes earlier or later, but there's one with like a, a more detailed skyline and one with a less detailed skyline. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, You'll I see one with like that. a thing. It's got like a single orange strip for the uh, skyline, but the other ones will have like uh, multiple layers to it. And we don't. You don't know which one's older. Um, it's hard to say because like I've heard stories from people who originally bought this stuff, and you'll see what's supposed to be a first edition tag, but the guy says he bought it at a sportswear store in 1979 or something. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Well, we, if anybody out there knows which one's older, we want that info. We're going to put, we'll put yeah. those two tags on the screens for you guys to like mm -hmm. look at. <clears throat> and they just basically like in the, in the, in the, in the vintage world, we call that the white tag, right? It's yeah. White label. Tag. Yeah. White label. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's um, what I would call it. Yeah. And obviously that's like the first, first iteration, the OG seventies. And uh, do you know when that tag got phased out for the black tag? Um, I would say around 1981, 82, because I was actually looking at the, um, Great Pacific Ironworks catalog from, yeah, 1982, and it actually features products with both the white and the black label. So I think it was like, uh, sort of a gradual transition. Huh. That's cool. So, so yeah, you, white label, you... white label stuff can take you into like the very early eighties. Okay. Do you have catalogs? 
Oh yeah, I have PDF, I have like PDF scans of them that you can okay. find online. Yeah, I've had a couple opportunities to buy them and they all like fell through. I've never been able to get any. Like, I yeah, I'm more invested in getting the actual pieces. Um, I'd probably only get catalogs if it was like a big lot of them because you can suck a lot of money into getting, you know, getting them one by one because they go for a clip sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> Fun side note on the catalog. So there's this guy, uh, the college picker. He was on the podcast, yeah. like in my first round of like 10 podcasts, maybe like way back years ago. And he, he had, I guess he had found a lot of these catalogs and he started to put them online <laughs> and yeah. like to make this arc archive of catalogs. Oh, I think I've like heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. And Patagonia shut them uh -huh. down, man. They were like, yep, yep, nah, yep. you can't do that. So they sent him a cease and desist, like lawyered up and, um, mm -hmm. and shut him down. They didn't want all that stuff just like accessible via the internet, which is very f interesting because We'll talk more about this, like as we get into the, yeah. the more modern history. But it's kind of like, uh, you know, that stuff was produced. It's free. Once you put something out like that, it's like in the public space, right? Like if you put a catalog yeah. out there to the world, it's in the public space. So, like, what difference does it make if it's on the internet or not? You've already put it out to the public. I feel like he could have easily won that if he wanted to fight it. But who wants to fight some stupid thing like that against Patagonia? No. It's not yeah. not really worth it. Well, yeah, at this, and at this point, the earlier catalogs are basically public domain at this point. You can, like, find them on the Internet Archive if you really, you know, do a, an hour or so of searching. But, um, yeah, the ones from the 90s are still, yeah, you got to get, like, you got to know somebody who has one to really, uh, if you want to like, look something up. Uh, yeah. But there's some Instagram accounts that'll post certain pages from them. All right, everybody, little intermission from the show here. As you know, this is the free 45-minute version of the show. But if you want to get the full two hours of this Patagonia episode, what you're going to have to do is go jump on the Patreon. You can find that link down below in the show notes or up in one of the corners here. Click on it. Jump on the Patreon. It's five bucks a month, hundreds of episodes for you to learn from on there on the paid ver portion of this episode, uh, full two hours you're going to learn a lot of values of certain garments. What are the most valuable Patagonia garments? What to look out for um, when you're shopping for Patagonia? Details that help you date Patagonia. Uh, differences between certain garments that can make it from $150 to $200 garment to $1,000 garment. You're going to learn a lot of stuff on the paid portion. So tap in and uh, enough of that. We'll get back to the free version. It's funny too when you look at histories like this guaranteed there's more knowledge about the brand's history outside of the brand than like people who work in the brand <laughs> yeah in some but, cases you know a lot of time i mean patagonia is they do have an archive they probably have like a couple people that work strictly on their archive um, oh yeah yeah it, i know that for a fact yeah right and then they also but I think like when you look at the history, like they probably only started that archive like 10 years ago or something. It wasn't like they always kept an archive because, or maybe yeah. they did maybe 20 years ago, but it, when you, most companies don't think to start an archive, like from the beginning, because they don't know they're going to be there 40 years yeah. down, the, down the line. So then there's le left scrambling to figure out their own company history at a point, just like the rest of us trying to put yeah, the they, pieces back together. Mm -hmm. Because um, that was the thing about Spinard as well. He was, he it doesn't like waste at all that dude he would not want to keep anything for posterity anything that they produce they wanted to sell and get out of there so anything preserved from them is mostly accidental or um again the last 20 years as they've been doing the archives they've been asking for donations so friends and family of the brand will be sending them things um but obviously in the 90s uh more recent they've been saving like you know samples wear tests that sort of thing, but they have a, they actually have a pretty um, substantial collection at this point, pretty comprehensive. Um, yeah, but it, it took stuff, it took some time to catch up. They weren't always archival and um, thinking about you know how they would be how the company would look fifty years on when they didn't even know that it would last fifty years. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, let's keep moving through the yep. history. So we're we're at the uh, the early tag into like the the uh the black tag but then i guess you know most people would know the stand-up short we'll, we'll we'll put that on screen mm -hmm. and also like 
they their most popular product of all time as everybody knows like they're famous for cre- kind of in, inventing or creating or making a garment out of the pile fleece fabric yep. essentially yeah the first to make the pile um yeah, I think the story goes that Trunard was again overseas and he found like a bolt of like synthetic pile fabric and he really liked the properties of it and really wanted to make something out of that. So when he came back to Ventura, he sent out his wife to go to like these garment factories and look for something similar. And yeah, the story goes that she found this bolt of fabric that was originally used for toilet seat covers and it was a synthetic um, fleece material. And so they brought all that and started making jackets out of it. And that was around like, yeah, 76, 77. Yeah, it's, I love that story. So mm. you, if, if uh, <clears throat> depending on how old you are, if you went to your grandma's house and she had one of those like fluffy toilet seat yep, covers, yep, yep. that's basically the same material. And I always thought those were nasty. I'm like, this is nasty. Like you got like a freaking fuzzy toilet seat cover. Yeah, yeah. Like, this thing must get full of mad germs <laughs> no but you, you gotta remember up until the 70s people were using like wool sweaters and like um you know uh like uh trimmings from animals for their installations so this synthetic pile was like pretty revolutionary in the fact that it would be it had these like yeah water repellent properties it's quick drying um uh yeah it was very durable uh, yeah br- breathable as well and, yeah like you would you know like a lot of things weren't breathable and you're right. <clears throat> when you trace the history of all sports apparel, <clears throat> cottons like weren't even a thing until like late 1800s, like the big mm. uh, like boom in cotton. Basically, everything was wool. Yeah. Uh, bathing suits were fucking wool. Like, how could you wear <laughs> a true. bathing suit out of wool? It's got to be uh. the most uncomfortable thing. Like, <clears throat> football jerseys were wool. People would like sweat yeah. their ass off all day in these like thick wool garments right so yeah when you look at those photos i feel for them football yeah, players dude. in the 20s yeah wild <laughs> and again like coming back to um innovation and functionality it all comes from from sport right like imagine mm-hmm. how good it would have been when when colleges and everyone else finally started getting caught and then they had sweatshirts and t-shirts and you know prior to um prior to like T-shirts were created as an undergarment. Basically, the T-shirt mm-hmm. is underwear. It kind of yeah. like morphed its way into acceptable everyday fashion like way later. But it was only oh, really yeah. underwear. Then it became acceptable for like sports or like working mm-hmm. out. And then eventually became iconic in fashion. But, you know, um, so yeah, you have like these, these this evolution of fabrics and um, – mm-hmm. It's super interesting that toilet seat covers are a big part of that evolution. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, they were they were the first to do, yeah, as I call it now, retro pile, their deep pile. Um, and those jackets, yeah, went through into the 80s. And, um, I mean, their next big innovation would be their snap tee. And yeah. that was, um, that was actually um, a collaboration between um, – Patagonia and Malden Mills, who we now know as Polar Tech. Um, and they actually co-developed what we know now as their Polar Tech fabric, or as Patagonia called it then, Cinchilla. And that was um, sort of them trying to solve a problem where they had low pile fleece before that, but it would, um, it would pile pill very easily, um, mat out, and uh, it was just too heavy. So them and Malden Mills got together and developed this like very lightweight um, but still you know, sturdy, uh, low pile fleece, which they then made into the snap team, uh, in the round like 1985, I think. Yeah. Nice. I didn't know that. So yeah, people don't know that polar tech was, it was, you have Patagonia to thank for it. Yeah. That's crazy. So, Mm -hmm. uh, when, you know, obviously polar tech would have been like a fabric, uh, factory technology innovator at that time. And I guess they like came together and they worked on a project, right? Yeah. Yeah. Was there like legal battles at any point of like who gets rights to this stuff or like did anything weird go down? Well, I think, I think Patagonia actually had like a two year exclusivity deal with um, Malden Mills where they were the only people to um, use the fabric. But then after that, 
that's why like later in the 80s you got this like explosion of um like people using polar tech north north face eddie bauer llb and that sort of thing ah makes sense Mm -hmm. um yeah okay crazy so i have i have this like sample of and uh i mean the one i have is probably from like the early 90s i guess but it's like a sample of the snap tea and it has all the different, yeah yeah like, uh, i'll put a picture on here guys or maybe a little quick clip of it and it it talks about like it's the most copied fleece of all time and you guys will even know that now because mm-hmm. there's been like recent lawsuits within the last couple of years of Big, huge, yeah. because fleece kind of, fleece actually, not kind of, it fucking had a massive boom in the last like five years. Like it came back into like fashion oh, yeah. and streetwear big, right? Because there was a time when like <clears throat> fleece never went anywhere really for like function, but like it, everything comes and goes out of like the limelight trend cycle for fashion. Yeah, yeah. And fleece came back in hard recently. There was a few lawsuits by Patagonia against people for literally copying the snap tee. I think one was fucking gap. Yeah. 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 It was gap. And I think like, yeah, it was gap. So they sued gap for copying this design because everyone wants to make that fleece that just has that look. The snap tee has a certain look. It's like the most iconic garment um, of fleece out there. And, and uh, yeah, and and you can copyright like a design that's specific. Mm-hmm. There's certain things you can copyright, certain things you can't copyright, but you can copyright that. So yeah, Very and over the years, over the years, people have made snap tee like garments, but they've uh, you know tweaked it a little so that it's not too egregious. Um, but that's actually what led to Patagonia falling out with LL Bean. Was um, so LL Bean is actually one of the first retailers to stock Patagonia through their mail order catalog. Like you can go way back in the seventies and you'll see it being listed like, uh, along with like Eddie Bauer and other brands like that. And, um, there are actually some old pile of uh, fleeces from the seventies that'll have an LL Bean tag in it. Those are really cool. Yeah, I have um, one. I have a, I have a, yep, a, re- yep, yep, a yep. reverse deep pile vest. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I might have a stand up short that has it too. Mm. Yep, yep. Very rare. They also did um, REI co-branding. Um, but once the Snap Tea came along and LL Bean wanted to start making their own stuff and gradually phase out like these third-party brands, they started copying Patagonia's design. And that sort of uh, led to falling out in like the later 80s, I believe. Yeah, uh, that's a cool piece of the history there. Because mm-hmm. I, think, I think originally LL Bean would have been... Um, like a outfitter, right? Yeah. Versus like a manufacturer. A lot of these companies started as outfitters where they're like, they're mm-hmm. stocking other, other, like primarily other people's brands. I think even yeah. when you go back to the history of Levi's, like Levi's mm. started as a dry goods provider for miners. And yeah. Then, Levi Strauss and company. It wasn't just Levi's. Yeah. And then it was, and then eventually they hit on a product. They're like, wow, we're just going all in on this product and we're beginning mm-hmm. manufacturing now. But so yeah, similar to LLB and they were just stocking people's stuff, co-branding with Patagonia. And then nowadays, like it's just strictly a manufacturer. It's almost, yeah. It's almost exclusively all their own um, private label stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Under the LLB name. Um, yeah. So this, again, this snap tee is relatively unchanged. I mean, you could probably talk about some detail changes, but relatively mm-hmm. unchanged from the first fucking iteration, 1985 yeah. till today, they've probably never stopped making it. I, I would guarantee if you looked at their, their, their books, it's like a number one seller, number one moneymaker oh, driver yeah. of the company. They put out like yeah. 10 colors a year, um, which is, which par- partly like becomes <clears throat> when we talk about collecting, it's like, got to catch them all. Pokemon, you got to get all oh, colors. Yeah. You got to get all the, the prints. You got to get all the fucking different years. Like they, like, and you can look at the, the colors over the, over the time span. And you're like, wow, in the mm-hmm. late eighties, they were going like major day glow colors. There's like some crazy bright oh, yeah. ones. And then certain years they went, they muted the color tone back and certain years they're putting out really interesting prints. And, um, yeah, it like yeah, really but- lends itself to collectability. Uh, it's definitely it's one of the rabbit holes that you can get into when you're first getting into Patagonia, where um, there's some people I know who just collect the snap tees. They just 
want every or they want like certain prints on every color from like a certain era yeah yeah that's super cool so um let's talk then let's talk uh while we're on snap actually i kind of want to rewind a bit i want to go back to this yeah. the i want to go back to the deep pile fleece talk for a sec <clears throat> so we told the history of it but let's talk about the actual details of it you know from mm -hmm. my knowledge there's there's a pullover that's got a yeah. quarter zip that has like mm -hmm. kind of a thick call a heavy collar yeah there's the full zip with the ribbing that's kind of like a jacket they probably called it a jacket at that time right yeah yeah they made a vest uh for mm -hmm. sure because i have that um they also made a hoodie yeah fuck i need the hoodie so those bad very, <laughs> those are insanely rare yeah you yeah, have yeah. you don't have like, one like no 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 uh early piece i have is from like the late 80s unfortunately okay mm-hmm Yes, the hoodie is so epic. I've seen them come and go. I've never been able yep. to get my hands on one. I don't even know if I've seen one in person, like at an event, mm. which says a lot because I've been to like all these crazy true vintage events. Oh, yeah. And seen so much yeah, yeah. stuff. You know, I think I've literally seen like some ended eBay auctions for them. So the hoodie is like the grail. My grail, I've talked about many, many times, is, is the burnt orange color, which I have a couple of now, but I'm still mm -hmm. missing. The proper white tag yeah one. they and they especially in the early days they would really mix and match um like you'll see uh jackets that are typically don't have ribbing sometimes you'll find one find some with it just on like the waist even or um they switch out the pocket design sometimes um later in the 70s they also did like a bomber jacket style which they brought into like the late 80s um but yeah, they did a lot with retro pile back then. Um, but those are the big ones. The yeah, ones and then so like off. for color palettes, you have the oatmeal, which is kind mm -hmm. of like most common. You have a blue color. Then there's the burnt orange, which I just said is my yeah. kind of favorite colorway. Is there more colors in that? Uh, there's like a heather gray, and there's yeah. like a bluish gray as well. There's actually a great photo of um, the one that uh, Yvonne wore back in the day was like a bluish gray, and they actually have it on display at the headquarters now. Yeah, I don't I don't think I have the bluish gray. And mm -hmm. then like <clears throat> these these pile fleeces kind of had a timeline too, because we're saying this yeah. it started in like the late seventies. The snap tee didn't come out till the till mid eighties, so there's like a six year period or seven year period of these deep piles uh, going through a different uh, timeline. And like for people who've never seen them, obviously well, there'll be pictures on screen, but like it's reversed, right? So like the the fleece on these is on the the fuzzy part is on the inside, and the outside yeah. is like the is like the backing of the fabric. So, so so like to the untrained person, or not untrained, but someone who's never seen one, you kind of look at it and you go like, this is weird, mm -hmm. right? Because it's which, which is funny because their like initial thinking is what like anybody would think. Oh, you want the insulation facing inwards. Like that'll keep you warm. That'll be the way to go. And that's how they kept it through the late eighties until um what is now called what is now known as the retro pile cardigan was created in nineteen eighty eight, which is they they reversed it. They put the fleece on the outside. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And then and then we see that, you know, that's still something that's in fashion and we're like, that's the way it should be. Yeah. That's why like these old ones look look weird to us. Yeah. But yeah, that's cool. Okay, let's jump into yeah, <laughs> back to Snap Tea talk here. So, um, you you and like we talked about, everyone collects these things. There's so many colors. Like, what mm -hmm. are what are some of the most sought after currently? So, this, there's like a golden era when it comes to Snap Teas, and that's from like the early night. It's when they started it. Around '92 is when they did the first printed um, pattern Snap Teas. And that ran all the way through like 1999 and they didn't start making them again until like the mid 2010s, I believe. Um, but yeah, the, there are a few patterns. So they, they had there. a, they had a full gap of no printed fleece. Yeah. People don't realize that from 99 through, I want to say like 2013, 2014, they didn't make printed snap tees. Wow. Um, there's like a couple exceptions where, um, they're called, uh, a uh oh it's like a snap marsupial but it isn't exactly a snap tee that has like a tropical pattern but yeah for the most part they just ended it in 99 spring 99 was like the last time they did it 
Uh, so, wow, that's that's I had no idea about that. I thought they mm-hmm. just kind of put out different patterns. So there you go. There you go. No. Ta- yeah. ta- so I know that like the the pattern you're wearing. Talk about the pattern you're wearing. Yeah, so this is a switchback from Fall '98, um, made famous by Tom Hanks in Castaway. Um, this is probably my favorite pattern of all time. I would say um, definitely like a top ten, maybe even top five in terms of desirability. Um, but then you also have uh, the mini ha ha, which is um, another wild pattern. Um, there's a specific colorway called Flame, and that regularly is one of the most like uh, expensive ones to go. But uh, I'd say like top, the top one is easily Zen Turtles. That's from I think '97, I believe. Yeah, Zen Turtles. Yeah, it's Zen like Turtles, Mini Ha. Repeating Ha-ha. turtle pattern. We'll put, we'll put these all on the screen. I need. I don't even know like the names of them all. So the ones you just yeah, mentioned, yeah, yeah. We'll have to, <laughs> I feel we'll hesitant just rounding off the names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I have a little stash of ones I found over the years. A few years ago, I sold off quite a few. Yeah. Um, and certain ones I seem to only find in like weird sizes, like kid sizes. Mm. There's like these like geometric ones that I always find in kid sizes or. Yeah, they would do a pa- so the way they would do it is they would do they would have a pattern they'd have patterns for snap peas for a season and then um for kids fleeces um they would actually do specific colorways of those that are only for kids fleeces. Yeah, and some of the kids ones were sick because you know they get a little more kind of Oh yeah, the wild. Colors are wild. The colors are wild. Mhm. And that's like it's like the big draw with the 90s stuff. The color blocking was just like really on point. The the um the refinement and just the style was really cool. Um, that and these printed snap tees from the 90s, they don't have a um, chest pocket. So that's how they differentiate a solid from a printed. So yours, the, uh, yours right now has no flat pocket. Yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no chest pocket. You have um, hand warmer pockets on the sides. Um, so that's, that's, how they, that's how they did printed snap tees in the 90s. The solid colors would be with the uh, nylon chest pocket. Crazy. I did, I uh, I guess I never really thought about that either. I never exactly. Yeah, that. and I think it it may it lets it lets the print sort of speak for itself a little bit more because you don't ha- it, it's not broken up by the, the pocket. Yeah. Um, so obviously, like that is that is one of the telltale details of a snap tee. It's like the cut of it, mm-hmm. but that that little flat pocket with the snap. It's got the snaps on the neck. There's yeah. like these details. So I, it's interesting. How many like other than these two different cut versions, is there any other like variants of snap tees? Well, like the earliest ones, they don't have, they added the chest pocket, I think in like the late eighties, early nineties, that was like a thing where people um, in the field wanted some, they wanted a pocket to like put stuff in. I think it was somebody, it was specifically somebody who wanted a place for their sunglasses, I believe. That's how they added the chest pocket. But the earliest ones, they just have the snap neck. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and there's a lot of questions out there about how how you date Patagonia. Um, mm. You know, we're kind of talking like obviously, like as we go through this timeline, you're going to see the differences in the dates. So, like certain things yeah. are very obvious. Like if you see a, if you see the white label, you know it's like it's it's old. But they also did they they made like retro white label pieces too, just as like oh, yeah. throwback throwback. So there's there's yeah, that yeah. shit out there too, which but that's pretty obvious. Mm-hmm. To anybody who knows vintage, um, but the 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 real telltale, I think, once you get into like the mid to late eighties, mm-hmm. they have the inside tag for sure on the snap tees, right? That yeah, that yeah, you can you can pick out the date on. Yeah, it'll uh, be a, a printed uh, paper label that'll be on like the interior of uh, on, typically on like the side seam. Does yours have it? The one uh, yeah, the one I'm yeah, the one I'm wearing. Yeah. Can you show it? Yeah, sure. So this little this little paper tag, like most companies, has the the season and the year. It's kind yeah. of done more for internal purposes, so they can. It's gonna be like, mad faded. This is probably mad faded, but yeah. Okay, uh, can't even see because of the light. Yeah, yeah, but, but it's there. Um, yeah, it's there. So there's it's always on the side seam. This little tag, and uh, we'll put a few examples on the screen of pictures. Oh, but it would be like F A for fall, mm-hmm. S uh, S S for spring summer, and it'll have it, it'll have a date. But the problem is with these dates, they only use the last two 
digits of the year. So yours says what? Yours says like... It'll be FA98. Yeah, so his says FA98, which is obviously, you know it's 98, but there's some that just say FA8, right? Which mm-hmm. could be 88. It's probably 88. But then people always ask me, is that 88 or is that 2008? And some, there's, like a, there's like a little bit of confusion on some of the years. You kind of have to do your best guessing beyond that. Well, I'll Which, say that when when they first did the um, these white these uh, paper tags, uh, the way they did dating was it would be a single letter and a single number. So, like, I have a fall nineteen eighty eight retro cardigan that just says F eight. Yeah, and then when they got yeah. to 08, was it F O eight or F A O eight? Well, when they got into the nineties, they would do like the last two digi- digits of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. There you go. That's how you date it. Um, it's mm-hmm. super handy. It's super handy that they have that. I didn't even know that for like a lot of years when I was yeah, yeah. collecting older stuff. It obviously none of that, none of those tags are on the deep piles. Um, it wasn't until like the the later eighties that they started using those tags, but that's how you can kind of check it out. And then if you want to get really nerdy, they also have a style number above that, which um, if you got like if you can cross cross reference catalogs, that'll um, that can tell you a lot as well. Well, there you have it, guys. The uh, end of the free 45 minutes has come. Now what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go jump on the Patreon, which is down in the show notes. Or what you can do is uh, join here right on YouTube and get the full two hours. Patreon's just five bucks a month. You get a one-week free trial, so you can go listen to this episode right now for free. You're going to learn a lot in the rest of the talk I have with Nick. And, uh, yeah, or join right here again, right here on YouTube or free one week trial and then five bucks on the Patreon. Thank you guys all for tuning in. I appreciate you so much. Make sure you sub to this channel because lots more podcasts coming your way. And there's over a hundred episodes to go back and rewatch. There you go. See you on the next show.